Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Please, this is the March 16th, 2020, 7 p.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. I'm Chair Amy Gailey. Um, to my right, your left, we have Vice Chair Steve Carter, Commissioner Bill Ashley, Commissioner Eddie Boswell, and Commissioner Tim Sutton. Um, Commissioner Boswell, would you please lead us in an invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance? Please go ahead, Tim. Let's bow our heads. Almighty Heavenly Father, we come tonight thanking you for the blessings you've bestowed upon us. Lord, we come in a time of trouble for our country. We don't know what's going on, what, how to deal with it, but God, we know that you're the answer. You're the one that can answer this, this pandemic thing that's going on. You were here in the beginning, you'll be here in the end, and you know how it works. So Lord, we just ask your blessings upon our nation, and God, just protect all of our first responders and our law enforcement and men overseas. Just protect them and look over them. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first item on the agenda was to recognize Tracy Norris Coble, a detention officer with the Life Saving Award, but unfortunately he is ill, not with the coronavirus, but with a different virus, and he's unable to be here tonight, so we're going to postpone that to the next meeting, when hopefully he'll be feeling better. Um, for public speakers, we do not have anybody signed up to speak tonight, so therefore we don't have any commissioner responses. Before we approve the agenda, I would like to um, seek a motion to amend the agenda to add a new number one uh, COVID-19 update before the Public Health Month proclamation. Second. We have a motion and a second to amend the agenda to include a COVID-19 update from, um, and that will be presented by Stacey Saunders, our Public Health Director. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So next we would be seeking a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as amended. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, before we uh, take a motion on the consent agenda, I uh, would be seeking a motion to amend it to delete item B, the out-of-state travel for the Sheriff's Office, B1 and B2. I understand that the Sheriff requested that we pull that item because of the uh, virus. They're not going to be traveling out-of-state. I will make a motion we amend it. Second. Take that out. We have a motion and a second to delete item B1 and B2 from the consent agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Anyone opposed? And then we'd be seeking a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as amended. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the first presentation tonight will be from Stacey Saunders and uh, possibly assisted by Debbie Hatfield, our emergency uh Director, um, Emergency Management Director. So, Stacy, uh, what can you tell? What is? What can we tell the public about uh, COVID nineteen in Alamance County and what Alamance County has been doing in response to it? Great. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to start kind of like I do with every EOC and start sort of from the beginning and go through. Um, so just to give you an idea of the timeline, uh, we first identified um, COVID-19 in China um, approximately in December of 2019. First known case in the U.S. was um, January 21st, and the first known case in North Carolina was on March 3rd. There are no cases at this time in Alamance County. 
the global uh, burden of COVID-19 is about 160,000 cases. As of the time I pulled this report, uh, with 6,000 deaths. In the United States, about 3,500 cases uh, with 60, uh, about 68, 70 deaths. In North Carolina, we currently, as of this morning, have 33 cases in North Carolina with no deaths. And again, no cases in Alliance County. And so um, just a reminder that COVID-19 um, is a lower respiratory illness. Um, that means fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Uh, the, when we look at the um, trends globally, the highest <coughs> risk group for severe illness, that's not necessarily the highest risk group to get the virus. It's just that if, the, if they get the virus, this group is the highest risk for severe illness. And those are folks over 65 years of age, those with underlying health conditions, and those with a weakened immune system. Symptoms usually um, occur within two to 14 days post-exposure, um, and if positive, um, a 14-day isolation from time of symptoms. So what's been happening here? Um, so I'll start with just saying the health department opened up their EOC several weeks ago. We just transitioned to a city, to a county city EOC. Um, on March 15th, and the county manager and the um, emergency management director will talk more about that. Uh, we have created a, a COVID-19 community call line um, that is housed um, at the EOC with a almost like a triage model, so uh, folks can call into that community line and they'll be greeted by a human um, who uh, will ask them uh, what their questions are, and if they're general questions, then those questions can stay at the um, EOC call center. If there are specific questions about risk or medical questions, those get transferred to a bank of nurses over at the health department. Also gets answered by a human. Um, we are, um, just like with any communicable disease response, the health department is charged with monitoring the communicable disease. Um, so we are doing surveillance. We are monitoring any travelers, um, any folks that come into our community. They have to do daily check-ins with us um, for temps. We are also testing individuals that might meet any criteria. We've tested two, both have been negative at this time. We're encouraging community partners, um, meaning our community providers, to also um, collect and test, and they can use private labs like LabCorp to do so. Um, the community providers doing this then allows public health um, to also then focus on that monitoring and surveillance and the contact tracing um, to help mitigate and make sure that we don't have any community transmission. Um, we also have been sending out provider guidance to all of our community providers. Uh, the last one we sent was on March 13th. Um, memo, was, memo from the health director and the medical director was also sent out to con congregate living facilities. So these are like your nursing homes uh, with recommendations about restricting visitation. Uh, we also modified the health department website. Uh, we've been posting on social media. The county also created uh, a modification to their website um, for folks to get information about COVID. So we continue to press upon um, the community that um, in the absence of a vaccine, we wanna make sure that you are washing your hands. Um, if you don't have soap and water available, sanitize with an alcohol-based alcohol sanitizer. Please um, use paw hygiene, that means into the elbow. Um, also sneeze there, or you can use a tissue and then throw the tissue away. Avoid uh, folks who are sick and stay at home when you're sick. Um, disinfect areas and a new term for most people in the world, um, social distancing. And so that means just keeping ourselves apart a little bit further. Not necessarily a great example in here. <laughs> Put the camera that way. <laughs> but putting some distance between you and other folks um, and limiting the time that you are out in the public if you don't necessarily have to be out in the public. And so these preventive and um, protective measures might seem to um, the outside world and to the public as um, really extreme in some ways. But the reason they're put in place, the reason our governor put them in place, the reason our president talks about them is that um, to reduce the community transmission. Currently, at this moment, we don't have community transmission in North Carolina. All those cases I told you about are either travel related or uh, related to a contact to a positive case. So we wanna, re keep, we wanna keep reducing that likelihood of community transmission. These protective and these preventive uh, measures also then protect our most vulnerable. Um, so those high risk groups that I told you about, the folks who are over 65 is with underlying um, health conditions and a weakened immune system. 
So, the, um, you know, this is a, an important part where those of us who are fairly healthy um, and might experience mild um, illness with this, it's our jobs to make sure that we protect the others, um, our neighbors, our families. Um, as I say to, you know, I was just saying to Mark that um, I think about mamas and papas a lot um, and, you know, protecting our grandparents and um, our elders in this community and folks who um, might have other health conditions um, or even going through treatments that weaken their immune system. So uh, important to do our part um, to make sure that they stay safe. And with that, um, I'll just add that the governor did um, mandate K through 12 school closure and cancellation of all events over 100 on March 15th uh, by executive order. And some other guidance has come out since then. Uh, this is a rapidly evolving um, situation. So um, you know, from there, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the county manager and the emergency management director to talk to you about what mm -hmm. the county is doing. Well, thank you, Stacy. And I, commissioners, I just can't tell you how fortunate we are to have Stacy Saunders as our public health director. There have been a lot of eyes on Stacy over the past uh, week. A lot of folks like me and city management trying to make decisions about what does this mean, what do we do, how do we manage, how do we uh, uh, help our department heads make good decisions with the public health in mind, and. Everyone has turned to Stacy and to her folks at Health, and we are very appreciative of that. So uh, we've got a great person in the right spot, and I'm very glad of that. Also to emergency management, uh, Debbie Hatfield, our emergency management director, has done an outstanding job. This is so different. It's a, such a strange event. It's not an ice storm, not a hurricane, something that we're all kind of wondering about, and we've got, we've got good people. So, And I'd also like to tell you that our employees are doing a fantastic job. A lot of fear out there, a lot of worry, and a lot of concern, and county employees are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. They're serving very well and in a very dedicated way. Um, county at this time, where our business hours remain the same. We haven't curtailed any any uh, openings of county departments or, or facilities. <clears throat> we have canceled park and library programs, and uh, but those facilities are still open. So the libraries are open, county parks are open, but we're not doing any organized programs at either parks or libraries. We also have canceled the land development plan meetings that were scheduled for uh, this week and uh, all the way through March 24th. We're working on doing a Facebook Live version on March 24th, so uh, people will still have the opportunity to hear what the uh, uh, folks that are working with our planning department say about land development planning in Alamance County. They'll be able to give feedback that way, and then we will schedule those meetings again once we are in a little bit of a, our access has returned to normal, right? So we will we will uh, schedule the live community meetings. And uh, the, the sheriff's office has curtailed some services too. They've made some adjustments uh, over in their lobbies about fingerprinting folks, and I think they've worked very well with the city of Burlington about animal control. Uh, they've, they've done a fine job too uh, and limited some uh, access to the detention center. And, of course, our courts have closed and adjusted schedules for some uh, – some types of hearings and proceedings that they must have. Uh, Stacy mentioned that we have set up a website. The website is alamance-nc.com slash COVID-19, C-O-V-I-D-19. It's available, big banner, right on the county's homepage. You can click there and see all the cancellations that county government's doing, as well as links to our, our municipal partners, too, and the feds and everybody and their brother. We've got it. That's a good one-stop place. Um, we have opened our emergency operations center. We're running it at a partial activation. That means it's open 12 hours a day, every day, uh, staffing with emergency management staff. And that is the location, too, for our phone bank. Uh, we do have a, uh, as Stacy mentioned, we have a telephone number that residents of Alamance County can call. The number is 336-290-0361. And that number is available from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. And that's for any questions about COVID-19. And uh, it's, it's medical questions, questions of concern, whatever uh, people have questions about that deal with this, uh, this pandemic, we are happy to take those calls. And uh, I really appreciate the folks that are staffing that. You know, I told you we, we curtail park and library programs. Those are the folks that are over there right now, man, in the phone bike. And they're very busy, but it's a, it's a great service for residents. And uh, from management's perspective, we are also evaluating, uh, we've asked all department heads to categorize their employees in a mission-critical way so we can see who are folks that absolutely have to be 
in every day, providing direct service to the public down to folks that we might be able to send home. Uh, we, we've almost gathered all that data. We'll be working over the next uh, couple of days to determine are there, are there county employees that we could send home and have them work from home and try to limit uh, everybody, the people's exposure to them and their exposure to folks too. But, um, and I, I know Debbie is in here. I saw her when I came in. Right yes, so Debbie, if you have something to add, I hope I haven't stolen all your thunder. But, well, uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought that was when you, when you go third, right? I'm sorry That's about right. that. Uh, basically, what Brian said, we're at the EOC 12 hours a day. Yancy and I uh, are there, my part timer chip. We are getting some requests from like the assisted living facilities for masks, uh, for hand sanitizer, for gloves. And it's really hard to get. We've not had a case here yet, so we're not one of the priorities that the uh, state is sending the overflow of this equipment. We've managed to get what we've had to have in here so far for some of the nursing facilities. Um, every day we are gathering information and I'm, we are sending out emails to all of the partners, the city and town managers. They're sending me their updates on what they're doing in their uh, areas. And I'm putting together this situation report, and you should be getting this. If not, let me know, and I'll make sure you're on that list. Uh, but it gives you the overall how many cases that's been reported so far, Stacy's update, and all the partners that's reported in. But basically, that's it for now for us. But we've been busy. The yeah. phones are ringing. <laughs> yeah, if you could please make sure that we're on the list to get that. I will. The, okay. Yeah, Michelle's. Yeah. Okay. What was the phone number again? Please? It's three three six two nine zero zero three six one. And that's eight a.m. to seven p.m. It's uh yes, eight a.m. to seven p.m. We're having people report in at seven thirty just so they can get situated and get it sit down. And, but we're there till eight. I ask a question, yeah. please. Uh, this just came out today, this afternoon, it was uh, CDC uh, on, uh, and I got Tori to make copies, but something that stood out all along, it was, seemed odd to me, that was the state of Washington, and it's my understanding that that's due to rest homes, and, and, and so well, can you comment, because they've had, I mean, third or fourth. You're referring to their number of cases, yeah. yes, yes, so if, um, just a reminder that when uh, the U.S. was seeing its first cases, it was in uh, the western, the Northwest and in Washington State in particular they had a nursing home that was hit very badly um, and um, about, a, a, about a week or two ago all the deaths that you saw the majority of them were from that area and so they were hit very very badly um, with that nursing home being sort of one of the epicenters of um, the, the illness. <coughs> And I hate to put it on such late terms, but you know, what was the situation there? I mean, how did that did it penetrate it or infiltrate it? I don't know the specifics, um, mm -hmm. but clearly someone in the nursing home uh, was ill. Um, and at that point, uh, the virus is pretty efficient um, in its spread and was spreading pretty quickly throughout the nursing home, um, probably more quickly than they could put uh, prevention and protective measures in place, even with restricting visitation. And that that is one of our most vulnerable groups. Um, so it's not groups. necessarily just starting there. It's the visitor coming in and it bringing could have been. it in. Um, I, don't, I don't know the specifics yeah. about Washington State, um, but somehow I've heard someone who was in the facility um, was ill, um, and the virus tends to be very efficient in its in its transmission. Um, and that's that the folks in that facility are the highest risk for severe illness being. I think we hit over four hundred some cases. Confirmed? Is that correct? Is that sound correct? In Washington? Yeah. I, I I can look that up for you, but I do not yeah, know that. I'm right just off. curious because you know, I'd have to have 400 some people in that rest home, you know, and you just, I mean, we've got a lot of senior citizens in this county, and uh, they're not allowed on business. Yes, which is exactly home. why um, from the health director's desk, we sent a memo, um, and our environmental health specialists who have to go out and uh, do the inspections of uh, the long term facilities anyway as part of the state regulations. We created them as a strike for it, like a strike team, so that when uh, we sent them out with that memo and the uh, current North Carolina guidance around visitor restriction, and that came from um, our, our, our health, the health director's desk memo. Have you seen the Johns Hopkins? I have. Is it? Yes. 
You what? I just brought it up on my computer. It's unbelievable. It shows yeah. the whole world <laughs> and it shows the number of cases. 174,000, I think, is what it is now. Yes, and so, yeah, yeah if you're watching that, there are cases. Say again? 181,000. Oh my gosh, I looked at it like yeah. all of that. Yeah. If you're watching that, that map, theirs is going up a lot quicker. I rely on our sit reps that come from the state um, so that we're all on the same page. But if you're looking at that, those cases are a bit higher. And I was just saying to someone the other day that um, since, you know, and before 1854 when Jon Snow did his mapping of Broad Street in London for cholera outbreak, you know, we were using mapping then and we we're using mapping now. The tools are slightly different, but um, help inform us and how we put precautions and interventions and strategies in place. Well, with the exception of our chair, we have a lot of people around this dais that qualify for being at risk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Don't count to use that, right? I just looked at it. <laughs> you told me this morning. Yeah, I'm not there. After this, all of us, hopefully all of us are going to do it. Does anybody else have any questions or comments for anybody? Um, I think, uh, Debbie, let's talk about the state of emergency. You and I have talked about, and I've talked about it with Brian and with Stacy, about whether or not to declare a state of emergency for Alamance County. Okay. So um, let's talk about that in public so people can hear those discussions and, okay. and the fruits of them, because I'm getting questions about that. Right. So, if we were to declare a state of emergency, what benefit would that give to people in the county? If any? At this point, and let me just clarify, a state of emergency is different than a disaster declaration. A disaster declaration means we would qualify for reimbursement, you know, through FEMA, should we meet that criteria. At this point, a state of emergency, it will put us like, higher on the list for starting to get, you know, equipment, uh, mask, hand sanitizer, once we get a case here. But, you know, the state is prioritizing, you know, where those supplies go because they are limited right now. Uh, so with that said, you know, I will tell you, 22 counties have filed a state of emergency. Now, about eight or nine of those filed today, and it's to the fact that schools are closed now and which creates a little more hardship on everybody because we're having to try to make arrangements for essential folks to get to work and try to take care of their kids too. So I think, and what they're telling us, you know, from the state down, there is a good chance that we may could get some money back and that's not, nothing in guarantee yet. If President Trump, you know, has money that he can float down after all this is over, we could get some reimbursement. The only way we could get reimbursement is if we filed a state of emergency. But the state of emergency can be kind of retroactive. So you were telling me that as long as you keep right. up with your expenses and as long as they're right. coded. So mm -hmm. like if we file it tomorrow, then we can get reimbursed going back. As long as you've been mm -hmm. keeping up with the expenses and you've been doing that. And we have, and I've asked all the, uh, the like all the municipalities to track your costs, whatever it is that you're spending, your employees or whatever, <coughs> keep up with that on a daily basis. So if we do get reimbursed, you know, we'll have a good shot of going back. And we already got the documentation. We don't have to go back and say, well, what day did I work on, you know, COVID. So um, there's really, at this point... Monday night, there's no just definite benefit to filing a state of emergency, right? I don't think at this point. I'm and we don't have any confirmed cases in Alamance County. So my thinking is that until we get a confirmed case or until something else changes, we'll file a state of emergency when we need it. Right, and if that would be if, if the president would start issuing curfews and things like that, then we would have to go ahead and file one. Okay. And it's only good for 15 days, so you know we got to keep that in mind. But you could always go back in and, and you know up your dates. So it's entirely up to us as a county, you know, if we feel like we should. The only reason I would say yes, we should, is if we did get reimbursed. Right, and we will. If we will if it's if we need to. Yeah. Not doing it now doesn't cost us anything, right? We only get reimbursed for 15 days of expense? No. The state of emergency is only it's, valid for 15 uh, it's days. It's only valid for 15 days. And you have to do it. Yeah. Right. So 
that kind of it? Does anybody have any up here have any questions or concerns about that? And um, and I will say, you know, when we file it as a county, all the municipalities is covered under it. Uh, some municipalities go ahead and file their own just for their own peace of mind if they choose to. And then um, I wanted to have a short discussion under this agenda item about the commissioner meetings because I'm being asked by members of the public if we're going to continue to have commissioner meetings. And I mean, I'm one of five people up here. And my thinking is that absolutely, you know, I want to echo what Mr. Hager said about the dedication and the sacrifices of our county employees. And they are so inspiring. And Stacy Saunders and Debbie Hatfield and so many others have done, they've just blown me away. Brian Baker, our head of Parks and Rec, is working so hard behind the scenes. And um, I feel like as uh, the elected people representing the public in this government that Sorry. we should show up and support them by doing our jobs. And you know, as long as we stay under that executive order, in ordinance of 100 or less, as of now, that could change tonight. I don't uh, think it's just a moving target right now. For it time. is. It really is. It's hard to keep up with it. But uh, and we're, we're moving into budget season, which is incredibly mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. We have to pass a budget by June 30th, and that is a long and arduous process that has a lot of stops between here and there. Mm -hmm. And it's our duty to make sure that we. Uh, we keep that keep that flowing in the direction it's supposed to go so that we can have a budget on time mm -hmm. right. and um, just to let the public be aware um, Mr. Hager the county manager and I have been talking about if there are restrictions on the number of people who can meet we would explore uh, like if there's 10 people can get together at one time we would explore how to do the meetings make it available to the public via Facebook or some kind of live transmission <coughs> with a camera, some kind of web access Early. so that the public is still able to attend virtually um, and then just have the essential staff here. So I want the public to rest assured that the public's business is going to be taken care of. Right. And a lot of counties are doing that. Okay. What's the biggest county? Is Wake County that's got the most or Mecklenburg? Mecklenburg. Mecklenburg and Wake second? Mm -hmm. You mean the most population? Confirmed. No, confirmed. no, Wake has the most confirmed. Wake has the most confirmed. Who's second? Right. Who's second? Um, I didn't print out that one. I have it. I think um, you have that. Right. There's 14 in Wake, 2 in Forsyth, 2 in Harnett, 2 in Johnston. And four in Mecklenburg. And four in Mecklenburg. So, Wake and Mecklenburg. Nothing in Durham County, Orange County. Durham has one. One. Mm -hmm. One in Chatham. One in Chatham, one in Craven, one in Onslow, one in Brunswick, one in Wayne, one in Clares. And one in Watauga. And one in Watauga. Mm -hmm. So, scattered around here and there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I wonder what the common theme is with all of that. Mm -hmm. you get one year, they so they knew they could probably stop it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stay at home. Any other questions? Yeah. I don't have any questions. Did I? Is there anything I didn't cover? Or anything I that think it's been very thorough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Stacey, um, do you have a proclamation about public health month? I sure do. Irony of ironies. It's April, April is so things are getting month. better, right? Um, so before you have um, a proclamation um, for April as public health month, then, um, I, you know, very timely. Um, and I do want to say just before I start that, um, to echo what you were saying, that um, it's been amazing to sort of see all these folks come together, um, both city and county, um, meeting together and talking about how we help each other. Um, and that's the beauty of the instant command system that, you know, when you come into an instant command system, your, your duty in the instant command system may be very different than your duty in your everyday life. Um, and watching folks come together, it's been it makes me proud um, of the folks who are here and working in those um, cities and those in those county governments and our community partners um, like the United Way and Impact Alamance too. 
um, and our, our hospital partners who are right now, you know, really being a huge support for public health. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for that. Um, all right, so with that, um, what you have before you is a proclamation um, for April 2020, um, and I'll just read it for you. Um, Whereas we hereby recognize and acknowledge 82 years of public health service um, to the residents of Alamance County, as well as the vast contributions of these services to the quality of life in our communities. And whereas the American Public Health Association has adopted the theme, looking back and moving forward for the 25 year recognition of National Public Health Week. And whereas over the past 25 years, Alamance County Health Department has continued to educate the public, policymakers, and public health professionals about issues important to improving the public's health. And whereas there is a significant difference in the life expectancy and health status, such as obesity or mental health and cancer across socioeconomic regions of the, the county. And this variance increases um, due to social determinants that negatively impact health, such as poverty, transportation barriers, and lack of economic opportunity. And whereas public health plays a critical, a crucial role in the foundation of good health and quality of life, quality of life lived by working to immunize people against disease, by working to control environmental health hazards and infectious disease, by improving the health of mothers and children, and promoting healthy behaviors in areas of tobacco use, physical activity, and nutrition. And whereas public health professionals help communities prevent, prepare, for, withstand, and recover from an impact of full range of health threats, including disease outbreaks such as mumps and emerging illnesses, natural disasters, and disasters caused by human activity. And whereas public health plays a critical role in eliminating health inequities and preventing chronic disease and injuries, resulting in improved productivity and decreased health care costs for all Alamance County residents. And whereas a continued focus on health promotion and disease prevention in Alamance County through collaborative partnerships with a multitude of agencies in the community to find solutions to health issues resulted in the implementation of dental health services in elementary schools, the formation of AC Hope, the countywide opioid misuse prevention task force, joining the NC Care 360 network as a pilot county, a new approach to completing the 2018 community health assessment by integrating health equity lens, and the health department achieving accreditation with honor status in 2019. And now, therefore, you, um, the Board of Health, both Board of Commissioners uh, for the County of Alamance, do hereby proclaim. Do you need me to read the rest? Um, <coughs> no. If you don't want, I mean, whatever you want. I can uh, proclaim. Can um, well, it seems more appropriate for you all. <laughs> okay. Fine. Yeah. I'll, record, I'll read it. <laughs> Bless your heart, you're so tired. <laughs> Thank you for recognizing that. The board of now, therefore, we, the Board of Commissioners for the County of Alamance, do hereby proclaim April 2020 as Public Health Month in Alamance County and call upon the people of Alamance County to observe this month by helping our community better understand the value of public health and supporting great opportunities to adopt preventive, preventive lifestyle habits in light of this year's national 25-year observance, looking back, moving forward. In witness here, whereof, I have hereunto set my hand in Alamance County, North Carolina, the 16th day of March in the year of our Lord, 2020, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 244th. So, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Let's give Stacy a round of applause. We're deeply indebted to you. Okay, Sheriff, you're on deck. Good evening, Commissioner. <laughs> Stacy, we appreciate you very much, believe it or not. We do. <laughs> we can get started. Uh, tonight, I'm going to give you the standings of Alamance County Sheriff's Office, uh, what they've done during the year 2019, and some other things that we're going to be talking about for the future. First of all, the presentation is a compilation of statistics and measures of Alamance County Sheriff's Office based on the 2019 year. To aid your understanding of, of what's going to be going on here, I want to explain to you, we have two different divisions in the sheriff's office and I say division we have the operation side which operates outside investigates all the crimes and we have our detention division our patrol uh, division consists of four patrol shifts 
and including green level. They respond to all the emergency calls coming in to uh, CECOM. Then we have our Criminal Investigation Division, which investigates all major crimes, frauds, property crimes. Tell you a little bit about the uh, frauds. Uh, our uh, office this year uh, had two particular cases where uh, a fraud was committed uh, with uh, Kent Coble. He had bought a piece of equipment that didn't exist and money was headed overseas and we were able to save him uh, around 300 and some thousand dollars for that piece of equipment and get that money back. Uh, also, uh, we had uh, impact fulfillment. I don't know why they done it, but they transferred a little over $500,000 and my understanding was it was en route to Africa, but our people got involved in it, notified the bank, the FBI, and we were able to save that man <coughs> over $500,000. Uh, and these are just a couple of things that uh, our fraud division had done. Special Victims Unit, they uh, investigate domestic violence, internet crimes against children, which is a massive problem right now in this nation, and uh, mental health. We have mental health, the guys trained strictly for mental health that will respond when we have an individual that is going into a crisis situation. This is where a lot of shootings occurring nationwide with people going into crisis, officers responding, they wind up having to take a life or get their life taken. And our people are trained to deal with those situations. On the operating side, we also have crime scene investigation, evidence and property control, specialized investigators. We have people assigned to Alamance County Narcotic Enforcement Team that are working the cartels and the major, major drug traffickers, <coughs> bringing the drugs into Alamance County. We also have officers assigned to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives federal agency working the gun problems in Alamance County. If you're convicted felony, you caught with a gun, they will come in and take over the case, go federally and get substantial amount more time in federal court. We also have people signed to Drug Enforcement Administration, which are working the major drug traffickers all the way from the Mexican border, southern borders, into uh, Alamance County. We also have the, uh, some assigned to the FBI Gang Task Force keep up with uh, what's going on in the Piedmont area as far as the gangs, what they're trying to infiltrate, what type of business they're trying to run here in Alamance County. We also have some assigned to the United States Marshal Task Force, which we have an individual that chooses not to come to court and we try to get them, we try to get them, it's manpower intensive, we turn it over to U.S. Marshal Fugitive Task Force and they'll run him all over the country until they get it and uh, they're very successful. We also have a street crimes division under the operation, vice and gang. Local street level big dealers here on the streets, which affects the quality of life here in Alamance County. That's what our uh, uh, vice and street gangs uh, crimes do. Special operations, these are the guys, anything the sheriff's asked them to do, they'll do. If I get a call from Bill Lashley, he said, look, I got a neighbor down here, I know he's dealing drugs, giving the neighborhood a hard time, I call my special operations division in. I say, boys, go down there and don't come back home. Somebody goes to jail. And they'll go lay on them. They'll watch them. They'll eat with them. They'll sleep with them until they catch them. Then we have our school resource officers. We have 13 schools right now, folks. And this is a very important position as those uh, school resource officers in those schools. We also have animal control working with Burlington. We have our civil process division and our court services, which is our bailiffs, and our court security. On the detention side, we have four platoons. We have special services, which has to wash their clothes 24-7. Uh, food services has to prepare the food. We have a medical unit, and we have maintenance that does all the maintenance in the jail with the county maintenance people. Then we have ICE detention, ICE transportation, U.S. Marshal detention, uh, detention uh, U.S. Marshal Transportation and State Inmate Transportation. We're transporting uh, U.S. Marshal inmates to courts in Greensboro, Winston, and Durham where the federal courts are held. And we're also picking up ICE inmates that have crossed the border illegally and violated another law in this state, bring them to our detention center where they're being held uh, until they are deported out of the United States. Uh, and these are our divisions. All right, this is uh, very interesting uh, that I'm sure y'all 
may not be aware of. Alabama skin continues to grow rapidly. The county averages an annual population growth rate of over 1% from 2010 to 2018, and that's as good as we could get was 2018. Population grew by approximately 10.1% to a total of 166,638 people. Of those residents, 20, and this was gotten from the census now, of those residents, 26.1 are below the age of 19 are presumably enrolled in Alamance County schools. Of those working age, 95% drive to and from work and thus can be found on Alamance County roads. Over 66% of county residents work within the county, which means 44% works out of the county or may not work at all. Based on the 2010 census, nearly 29% of the county residents live in the rural portions of the county. This represents a large portion of the county's population, but it is nonetheless important to note that all county residents depend on the sheriff's offices, services both directly and indirectly. What a lot of people do not understand, we have to go into the city many times, civil papers, even arrest warrants, even drug problems. And uh, that uh, you know, causes a lot of work that uh, normally uh, uh, a municipal law enforcement agency don't have to do. They don't have to serve civil papers. They certainly don't run to jail. Leading all municipalities in the city of Berlin has an estimated population of 53,748 as of 2018. The cities of Mevin, Graham are second and third most populated municipalities at 15,589, 15,086 persons respectively. All other municipalities are much smaller, but the population of Elon and the resilient traffic swells during the season of class or in session at Elon College. And you would not believe the amount of traffic increases when uh, school opens and they come to town. I'm telling you. And with that, it causes problems for us too. Because a lot of drug traffic is coming into Elon, try to, to sell to the college, and, and we, we have to work it. As already stated, Sheriff's Office drives services both directly and indirectly to all county residents where they live within the municipality or not. For example, the Sheriff's Office serves civil papers, provides court security, and maintains the county jail on behalf of all residents, and that is a headache. Mr. Lashley, I can tell you. <laughs> Additionally, the Animal Patrol Division is one of the only two dedicated animal services divisions in the county and assists municipalities as needed. Moreover, deputies spend a significant amount of time traveling through the city so they naturally encounter residents they, that uh, they might not otherwise encounter in the rural areas which are violating certain laws. Trafficking drugs, uh, stolen cars, etc. More importantly, though, criminals from the city do not confine themselves to the city or municipal limits and vice versa. Therefore, it is not uncommon to find the offender per perpetrating crimes uh, in the city as well as the county. As a result, Sheriff's Office investigations do not stop at the city limits. And its various divisions can be found working inside municipalities pursuant to the Sheriff's Office investigation. Initially, Sheriff's Office assists municipal agencies, and we do a lot of that working together. We have a wonderful working relationship with all the other agencies in this county and all the other departments in this county. Including you, girl. <laughs> in addition to population demographic, traffic volume statistics show the movement of people within, out of, and to the county can be useful in determining the impact of a given population on government infrastructure. I don't know if y'all paid close attention, but the traffic here in Alamance County uh, it's almost like it is in California in some of the areas, and, and it's growing every day. On average, the interstate sees nearly 120,000 vehicles pass through this county each day. And I can tell you this, a lot of your cartel drug traffickers are coming right down those interstates. Additionally, in Burlington, U.S. 70 from Guilford County tallies nearly 14,000, and in Mabin, U.S. 70 from Orange County tallies 9,000. You say, where are you getting these figures here? From the Department of Transportation. They have counters up. They do this all the time. Although much of their affairs begin and terminate at the county lines outside of municipalities, these roads see substantial traffic every day as evidenced by the counts below. NC 87 North, 3700. NC 62 North, 
2,000. NC 49, 2,900. NC 119, 2,000. NC 62, 2,800. NC 49 South, 2,100. NC 87 South, 2,700. NC 54, 6,600. And you can bet that a lot of the criminal element are passing through this county from other counties and also coming to Alamance County to commit their crimes. During 2019, the Sheriff's Office handled 86,404 calls for service. Calls for service with an average response time, and this is amazing, 12 minutes and 47 seconds. We are covering 435 square miles. And most of the time we only have nine patrol deputies on patrol, which is uh, could be dangerous. And an average total call duration of 54 minutes, 12 seconds. Now let me tell you this, that is not the reports these deputies have to do. It's several hours in doing reports. That's just the amount of time on scene prior to clearing scene. Typically calls of service are handled by the patrol division. This is in comparison to... Uh, 82,057 calls for service in 2018, an increase of 5.30%. However, ladies and gentlemen, this is the only the calls coming into Central Communications. The most numerous calls for the type of service, 5,525 security checks, uh, 6,926 extra patrols, 32,517 business checks, 3,085 warrant services, and I'm telling you right now, you got a warrant for an individual, you have to go find him. He ain't gonna, he don't give yourself in. I can tell you, there you go. 4,458 speak to an officer calls, 1,786 alarm calls, 2,495 animal calls, and 1,254 emergency line 911 hang up. Now, let me say this. This is not all the calls that comes into that sheriff's office. And how many, and it's not those that walk in. We have probably every day, we probably have seven to ten people walk in, want to report a crime or something involving uh, uh, some problems with, with another neighbor or sir. In addition, calls for service, which are rooted through Alamance County Central Communication, Sheriff's Office also receives a large amount of incoming telephone calls via publicly available direct numbers coming to get me. <laughs> Total calls for the year on those lines were, and this is uh, 2019, 12,100 calls to the main line, 570-6300. 1,133 calls to the Sheriff's Secretary line. Believe me, I'm a living example of that. I stay on that phone with people with problems that we try to help wherever we can. That's our job. 13,159 calls to the detention center. 99 or 999 calls to the civil division questions about civil papers or what they need to do to get a person removed to iterate these calls are in addition to those received by CECOM combining the two numbers this results in a total call volume of 113,795 calls as already stated the total division handles most of the uh, calls for service additionally they completed 603 field contact cards on suspicious individuals they encountered during the course of their duties where the encounter did not rise to the level of arrest some type of report. More of the patrol division resolved 454 domestic violence incidents where there was no probable cause for charges or where the incident did not warrant extensive investigation. To note, those incidents are nonetheless followed up by Special Victims Unit. Where there is evidence of a domestic violence, we're going to call our domestic violence special victims unit follow up to make sure that that individual is safe. They call 911 because we have a lot of over the nation domestic violence murders, officers being killed responding to the call, or victims of domestic violence. Further patrol com the, the, the division completed majority of 4,846 incident reports that were taken by the Sheriff's Office during the year for any and all reasons. Burglaries, assaults, domestic violence, incidents where a crime occurred. Lastly, in concert with the Special Operations Division, the Patrol Division conducted the majority of the agency's 
3,470 traffic stops. As a result of those traffic stops, 1,072 citations were issued and 236 arrests were made. Now, a lot of these arrests that were made were your drugs being hauled or people uh, hauling drugs or driving with no lights on or something being stopped and lo and behold, the high as a kite with drugs in the car, etc. During the, re uh, the year, the Criminal Investigation Division was assigned 755 cases involving property crimes, frauds, general assaults, death investigations, and other non-narcotics or non-special victim related crime. Specifically, 200 of those cases alone were the fraud investigations like we did, uh, stopping the money, going after, etc. Pursuant to those cases, Criminal Investigation Divisions recovered $1,207,727 worth of property and made 667 charges on 165 arrests. Now, when we say on 165 arrests, uh, Mr. Carter there may have broke in 10 houses. Well, that's 10 different charges. Uh, or it may be more. Do one end? You only caught one. That's what you thought. <laughs> <laughs> the Special Victims Unit received 1,419 cases conducted, 1,181 checks on sex offenders. We have it said followed up uh, on 807 domestic violence incidents, served 594 domestic violence protective orders, made 636 arrests, handled 246 involuntary and voluntary commitments, and conducted 433 follow-ups on mental health related calls. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, we have 400 sex offenders in this county, and it, let me tell you, you try to check on them too. A lot of times they are very evasive. And these, these are things that we try to keep up with before they go out and act again. To note, the Special Victims Unit is tasked with overseeing nearly 400 registered sex offenders living in this county. Street, Street Crimes Division, working with Alamance Narcotics Enforcement Team, focuses this effort on reducing the occurrence of street crimes, those related to narcotics and gangs. During the year, the Street Crimes Division and ANET made 467 arrests, conducted 1,666 hours of surveillance, and seized the following amounts of property, $1,178,579.51 in U.S. currency. That's been taken from drug dealers. 83,368.51 grams of cocaine, 98.41 grams of heroin, 641.24 grams of methamphetamine, and 28,756 grams of marijuana. And that is only a drop uh, in the bucket of what's coming into this county, I'm telling you. Specialized investigations such as those working on federal task forces made 67 arrests, investigated, I want you to remember this, investigated 48 human trafficking cases charged 15 uh, federal firearm violations and executed 62 warrants. The crime scene investigation being which includes evidence of property control collected 2,544 pieces of evidence and worked 339 unique crime scene cases. Now I will tell you as sheriff of this county I said any unattended death would be treated by, like a homicide until it is proven different and that's what my people do. At the end of the year, Sheriff's Office had nearly 23,000 items held in evidence. We're running out of room, Brian. <laughs> We're running out of room. The school source uh, resource officer division handled 2,145 calls for service within their schools, which are generally counted independently of the overall agency calls for service. Pursuant to these calls, they made 3,046 student contacts contact and 1006 parental contact. There were also some charges filed uh, for certain ones, but because of juvenile and stuff like that, we don't have that in this particular point. Sheriff's Office, Sheriff's Office Special Response Team is trained and equipped to handle emergency high-risk situations and are deployed with when there is an increased threat to the safety of the officers or the public. The team trained 140 hours during the year and were deployed 25 times. The Sheriff's Office Mobile Field Force is utilized when there's a risk of civil disorder. They trained 76 hours during the year and were deployed 
five times. One particularly notable deployment was witnessed by some of the commissioners here. Deployment was November 24th involving demonstrations of 300 protesting that were protesters that were blocking the roadway on South Maple Street and West McCadden Street in Grand. The mobile field force units held the demonstrators at bay until the situation came to a peaceful resolution. The unit also assists other agencies as needed, for example, at the request of Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. The unit will be deployed to the 2020 Republican National Convention in Charlotte. A federal grant has been obtained by the Charlotte PD. They're going to pay for all salaries, everything, food, everything for those officers. They are, they are expecting major problems at that convention. Sheriff's Office drones were deployed 36 times during the year. Drones are utilized to assist in locating missing and endangered subjects such as juveniles. The elder or anyone else as deemed necessary. Additionally, they assisting in locating suspects and performing any of the variety of functions in emergency situations. We have deployed the drones and found people that have uh, wandered away from nursing homes, kids that have run away. We are able to get the drone up and uh, search for people that have run from a crime or even crime scenes. Emergency spot unit, the Lenko Bearcat. I caught a lot of heat over getting that Bearcat. But let me tell you, I'm going to tell you some things about it you'll see in just a minute. During the year, Sheriff's Office was fortunate enough to acquire a new state-of-the-art off-road capable armored vehicle that has already been utilized, already been utilized in several high-risk warrant scenarios, Bearcat subject incidents, and hostage situations. The armored vehicle platform of the Bearcat produced by Lenco can be utilized in rescue missions, active shooter situations, and another other deadly encounters. The number one goal uh, is a tool to enable officers to respond to high-risk situations where they can render aid and save lives. The Bearcat was purchased, please listen, media, through the drug asset forfeiture money. It was ta money is taken from the drug dealers. There's the picture of the Bearcat. Emergency. Hey, See that? Okay. I think you ought to put that in the Christmas parade. In the what? In the Christmas parade. <laughs> <laughs> we, well, we might do that. <laughs> Just don't pull the caucus on us, though. Do what now? I think the commissioners ought to ride the bike. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Remember Mike Dukakis stood up out of a tank wearing it. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. That's cool. Yeah. I like Let it. me tell you something. Just this past week, we got called by Rockingham County Sheriff Sam Page. They had a barricade suspect. The barricade went. The guy was taken in the coast out problem. Several weeks prior to that, on Sunday morning, we had a, a hostage held inside the house at Alpha Hospital, just off Highway 87. We had to pull the Bearcat. The guy would not release the hostage or come out. But when that Bearcat pulled up to his front door, he released the hostage, and then he went and hid somewhere in the house, and we found him in the house. Uh, that Bearcat is for officer safety and uh, citizen safety. For instance, if there had been houses real close to this, we could use that Bearcat to get those citizens out of the area before we went in. During the year, Sheriff's Office was fortunate enough to acquire a new state-of-the-art off-road capable armored vehicle that has already been utilized in several high-risk situation scenarios, barricaded subjects, uh, instances. This armored vehicle platform with the barricade produced by Lenko. If you will look at this particular picture here, you will see this is November 24th. Now, the front line is our mobile field force. They're well-trained, and uh, uh, we use them in... Uh, situations that uh, like the uh, I call it demonstration there those individuals had pulled coffins into the middle of the road uh, and was refusing to do things our mobile field force come in pushed them back out of the street and you see some of the other officers uh, sort of backing them up that is very important in uh, civil unrest are those the ones that were going to take a shot yes sir and I'll put them against anybody <laughs> You don't, you don't want to demonstrate, put, try to push them back, I can tell you that. Uh, okay. During the year, Sheriff's Office, by the way, of the uh, Detention Division processed 9,641 admissions at the Alamance County Detention Center and maintained an average daily population of 489 persons. 
of the omission. Sums are undoubtedly the same individuals, but multiple times throughout the year on different arrests, but most uh, are unique persons. We have some people, well, we rested one Sunday morning. We all had to come out on a raid Sunday morning. We rested them about two months ago. They let them loose. Didn't let them sign the bond. Hit them again two weeks later, drug it, went. Let them out. We hit them again Sunday and uh, put them back in jail. Who knows what's going to happen. But it's getting aggravating. Uh, and these are drug dealers, known drug dealers. Regarding bookings, there were new arrests versus the individual coming to the detention center on a writ for any other non-arrest reason. Local agents accounted for the following numbers. Now, I want you to pay attention to these numbers. Alamance County Sheriff's Office put in 3,405 people. Berlin Police Department put in 1,866. Elon University, 19. Elon uh, Police Department, 50. Gibsonville, PD, 165. Grimm Police Department, 528. Hall River Police Department, 118. Medlin Police Department, 326. North Carolina Highway Patrol, 216. We put, we made more arrests than all the other agencies put together. And we don't have the condensation of the population that the city says. So please pay attention to that. Animal Control. Sheriff's Office Animal Control Division works in conjunction with the uh, city of Burlington equivalent and is stationed at the Burlington Animal Services facility. For the year, Burlington Animal Services reported a 92 positive outcome rate on an intake of 5,638 animals. That is almost unrealistic. City of Burlington accounts for 29% of those intakes in the county and outside municipal limits accounts for 50% of the intake. During the year, only 174 animals were forced to be euthanized, while 150 were euthanized at its owner's request. The result is an overall unionization rate of 5.69%. This is a stark contrast to years past, such as the last peak in 2011, where there were 7,013 intakes and 5,388 animals euthanized, resulting in a euthanization rate of 76.83%. So they are, by doing uh, uh, things with the animals, etc., uh, they're not having to euthanize as many. Burlington Animal Services is managed by the City of Burlington in partnership and funded by both the county and the city. Civil papers. Folks, there's a headache with civil papers. Nobody wants to have a civil paper served on, I can tell you. The Sheriff's Office received 14,376 civil papers for a service during the year. Of those, 11,179 were served successfully, while the rest were returned unserved to the clerk of court. Those papers included 1,797 civil summonses, 3,689 magistrate summonses, 3,134 subpoenas, 360 executions, 869 writs of real and personal property, 419 juvenile summonses, uh, 726 involuntary commitments, and 554 domestic violence and no contact orders, and 1,374 orders to show cause. Once again, I want to reiterate that these people, a lot of these people, don't want to be found, and it is manpower. <coughs> Uh, intensive. We have to go back numerous times. We, you know, we have to chase them all over the place to uh, get some of these papers served. So we're very lucky to get as many served as we did. Civil papers are primarily served by the civil division, particularly those requiring expertise, but other divisions drip it heavily, heavily as well. For example, the majority of the subpoenas are served by the administration. My office people, girls sitting in the office there. And patrol division, most involuntary commitment and domestic violence orders, uh, violence protective orders are served by the special victims unit. Those particular papers are very dangerous for officers to serve domestic violence. And a number of the civil papers are served in the lobby, sheriff's department, by any deputy available. Front office statistics. During the year, the administrative division process 1,543 pistol purchase permit applications and issued 3,078. You say, well, how did 1,543 apply and issue that many? You can get as many pur purchase orders as you want as long as you pass the background and you pay the $5 per 
purchase. 954 initial concealed handgun permit applications, 1,186 concealed <coughs> handgun permit renewals, 1,374 miscellaneous fingerprint cards. We fingerprint teachers. I know when school started, our lobby filled up with I don't know how many teachers to be fingerprinted because they, the school has to have a record and fingerprint and it just worked. Since the initial concealed handgun permit application required fingerprint and sheriff's office, fingerprint over 2,300 people for non-criminal matters. That's teachers, people wanting jobs, or wanting to adopt a child, etc. Training statistics. Sheriff's office personnel training His main goal is to offer up-to-date and valuable training opportunity to officers so as to equip them to best handle any situation they might encounter. During the year, the uh, year Sheriff's Office recorded the following numbers of uh, training hours. 4,094 hours of state required training for deputies. State requires that much. And I'm telling you, with the, the man, man, manpower we've got, having to pull them off the street with vacation, sick leave, etc., it's tough to, to get them in there. 2,530 hours of state required training for detention officers, that's detention officers only, 13,137 hours of training beyond that which the state required. I believe if my expectations of my officers are up here, I need to supply the training necessary to keep them up there. And we have. We've got good officers, detention, and outside very well. Altogether, this represents a total of 19,000 761 hours of job-specific continuing education. Miles driven, this is where it's going to shock you. Due to nature of law enforcement, Sheriff's <coughs> Office spends a significant amount of time on Alamance County and North Carolina roads. I tell my people, if you're not on the call, you better be moving around, you better be checking the stores and the businesses in the county. If you see the old farmer on the, working on the tractor or something, get out and talk to him. That's where you get your information of those individuals that are not needed in the community, the criminal element. During the year, Sheriff's Office logged 1,619,952 miles driven. This number includes most, but not all, of the Sheriff's Office vehicles. Specifically, not all miles were logged as many vehicles do not receive tracking devices or did not receive tracking devices until March of 2019. Furthermore, there is often a delay in when the Sheriff's Office receives a new vehicle and when the GPS device is installed. Thus, not every single mile is accounted for throughout the year. Based on a 10-month average, 150,495.6 miles is logged per month. It is estimated the total miles for the year would be close to 1,800,000 miles. That's a lot of miles for our people to drive. Now, I'm going to get into uh, what I say is some of the crust of what we've been trying to, to show you and uh, try to get our people up to par with the other agencies in the county and go over the recruiting experience applicant. In addition to difficulty in tra attracting new applicants and retaining officers, retaining officers, in some cases, Sheriff's Office faced an inability to attract officers with prior experience. One of the benefits of hiring experienced officers is that the agency often obtains individuals who have already received valuable job-related training and are patrol-ready, thereby reducing personnel and hiring expense, which is massive that you will see in just a minute. The primary obstacle is to offer an experienced officer a competitive salary without hiring them at a higher wage than a comparable officer that is already employed with the Sheriff's Office. For example, consider the following scenario and put your place an officer that's already working for the Sheriff's Office. Employee A has been with the Alamance County Sheriff's Office for 36 months, qualifies to be a Deputy Detention Officer 3, to pay grade 68, with a starting salary of $38,128. Applicant B, who is currently employed by another agent and has been there 36 months, and thus has the same amount of experience as employee A, would like to submit an application to Alamance County. At that other agency, the average salary equivalent to the Alamance County Deputy Detention Officer 3 is $50,833. And we wonder why we're losing some of these officers with a lot of experience to these other places. 
Thus, either Africa B would have to incur a $12,705 pay decrease, or Alamance County would have to hire him or her at a rate higher than employee A, thereby causing retention issues with existing personnel. Think about it. If you were working in Alamance County and I hired a guy and you were working just as hard, just as long as the officer I hired coming in and I put him at a higher salary than you, you'd get ill. I would. Okay, hiring costs. This is where we get into the, the nitty gritty. Training equipment and initial salary. As you folks uh, see, the uh, cost of the background screen, screening, uh, uh, salary during six weeks of in service training, this is for detention officers only here. Books and materials, uniforms and equipment, you're looking at $9,637.25. Okay, then when the detention officer field training, we have to pay their salary. You see that the total of $15,606.87. Well, let me just say this. We lost last year 23 detention officers at the rate of $25,244.12. What it cost us to replace that officer, 23 officers, was $580,614.76. That's almost a 5% raise for my people. Almost 5% raise. Then let's look at the BLET the right there. You've got that cost of background screening, uh, salary during training, 16 weeks, books and materials, uniforms, ammunition, etc. Total of $21,533. Then you look at the trainee's salary. He has to be in field training for 16 weeks, uh, going to be able to teach, et cetera. And then the training officer salary who has to work with him during that point of time, you're looking at, I think, at $46,504. And we had to hire eight new ones last year because eight left for better salaries elsewhere. You're looking at $329,490. That's over $800,000, $900,000 right there. And that, that is very important. We lost two civilian employees, but we re, they're not hard to replace because there is people that come in that we hire straight up, don't have to go to any training other than within the office hour with personnel to learn what, what they're doing. From January 2019 through February 2020, the Alamance County Sheriff's Office experienced, yeah, experienced a turnover rate of 33 people. 33 people, and we have only three, I think 311 positions in the sheriff's office. Some of those are, have not been filled because we don't pay high enough salary. Uh, that's almost uh, 10%. Almost 10%. Of those, 23 were detention officers, eight were deputies, and two were civilian employees. Their reasons for leaving include both personal and economic reasons. Regardless of the Pacific Radio Sheriff's Office budget was negatively impacted by their decision. The following tables represent, as you see up there, the dollar figures that are associated with hiring, equipping, and training new personnel to fill those vacated positions. These figures are derived from the cost of background screenings, uniform and equipment, books, and materials for training. The figures also include salaries for those officers and salaries of those field training officers who are tasked with training new employees. Five hundred eighty thousand six hundred and fourteen dollars and seventy six cents for the twenty three detention officers we lost. If you will look at the eight deputies, same scenario, three hundred and twenty nine thousand four hundred and ninety dollars. It's costing us a lot and, and it's almost like throwing our money away when we can't keep these individuals. You see the civilian also uh, and I won't go into that. Next page. Is uh, starting salary comparison. Brand new deputy sheriff versus police officer. Ultimately, the sheriff's office has asked its employees to do more with less. And believe me, my people are working hard every single day, pulling overtime. Some not getting paid, I'm sure. Uh, they come in early, they leave late uh, because we have to to survive. Surrounding age, I often have starting salaries for a new employee that are 10% or higher than Alamance County. Some are listed below in order of lowest salary. If you'll notice, the Alamance County Sheriff's Office starting salary, which is in red, 
$34,917. Guilford County, starting Saturday, $36,731. A 5.2% difference. Burlington Police Department, $38,272. 9.61% difference. Elon College Police Department, $39,3140. 11.78% difference. Durham County Sheriff's Office, 39343, 12.68% difference. Orange County, 39978, 14.49% difference. Mabin Police Department, $40,614, a 16.32% difference. Elon University, $41,200, 18% difference in the salary. And we took the average, and the average was 12.58%. We're way behind. We're way behind. And what gets me is my people, I'll put them against the, every one of them blasted police departments doing anything they want to do in the criminal justice system, and we'll outdo them. The, the following slides uh, address, the following slides address different concepts regarding service. Please note these terms below are how they are utilized in this particular presentation. So, starting salary is the lowest rank base salary. Deputy one, base salary, minimum salary uh, for any particular rank. Salary range, the range between the minimum and maximum salaries for a particular rank. And average salary, the average of salaries of employees currently at that particular rank. There will be difference between the individuals based on yearly evaluation, education, etc. obtained. Base salary comparison. These are actual salaries obtained from the other departments. Deputy one starting salary, 34,972. Compared to a police officer one for Burlington, 38,272. Elon, 393104. Madden, 40,614. Automatically, the closest in here, the area here, you're looking over $4,000 difference. Some of them, five and 6,000. Deputy two. $39,047.72. Burlington, $41,092. $41,092. Elon, $40,982. Mevin, $42,644.70. Police officer two, that was compared to the deputy. Deputy three, to a master police officer. Deputy three, $42,408.89. Uh, Burlington, $44,733. Elon, $43,031.73, and Mevin did not have someone in that particular figure that, uh, and they we did, was not able to get their cost there. Corporal, Corporal Alamance County, $45,611.45. Uh, 44, and Mevin, we could not get the corporals from the other departments. They don't want to give us stuff. We're, they're afraid we go up, we're going to take their people. I hope we'll be able to do that someday. <laughs> Sergeant, and we got it all the way across. Sergeant for Alamance County, $51,648.37. Burlington, $64,272. Elon, $47,442.48. And uh, Mevin, $47,015.78. Lieutenant, this is where you really start with Burlington, seeing them pull way away from Alamance County, and that's why we're losing officers. $59,013.86 Sergeant, I mean, excuse me, Lieutenant and Burlington, $77,126. That's a big increase. Captain, really starting to pull away. Our captain, $67,757.77. $85,696. Major, their major is like their assistant chiefs up there. We got $77,535.25 to their Burlington's $89,981. And then you see Elon at $63,577.44. Chief deputy, and they don't have chief deputies, but uh, they're like number two in command up there. It probably, I'd say, is $110,000 easy because chief, about $120,000, $130,000. <coughs> Average salary comparison, in addition to disparities in base salaries for the same rank between ages, there's a significant difference in the average salaries for the same rank between agencies. If you'll look below, 
These are the average salary comparisons, um, as you will see. Yeah. Uh, Tension on Officer 1, 36, 3, 167, Guilford 38, 6, 7, 7, Orange 37, 129, Durham 41, uh, 55, and you you can see them on the board. I don't have to, to uh, show you, but as you see, we are way behind uh, on some of these people. And they take our people. Believe me, they do. And the thing that I can't reiterate to y'all is not only do they take the money and take them away from us, but they're taking some of our people, eight, nine, and ten years experience that you can't replace by hiring a new guy out here. And with that comes problems, things that could happen to cause lawsuits that cost the county every day if, if, if something goes wrong because of lack of experience or training. That's why it's so doggone important that we're able to hold on to these people because uh, right now, 60% of our detention center employees have been there probably less than three years. What percent? I, what do you say, 60%? 60. Yeah. I'd say 60%. Uh, we're going with the uh, uh, comparison continue. I don't have to sit here and read all that data. You can look at it and see. We're hurting in, in that respect. We're hurting. If you look at our salary schedule, had we maintained that study we done to where you get them up to the mid level, et cetera, we'd be a lot better off because we're we're showing the ten deputy attention officer one pay grade sixty seven is thirty four nine seventeen mid level salary forty five three ninety maximum salary fifty five eight sixty two then you go on to attention officer three corporal <coughs> lieutenant so, uh, sergeant lieutenant captain and major as you see up there we're behind. Look at the difference. Uh, it's just, I don't know. Sort of upsets me. Because I'm going to tell you something, folks. I have the best staff that I have ever had in my going on 19 years of sheriff's office. We're doing more than any other agency in the surrounding counties in this state. And the, the thing is, we're wearing these people out. And when somebody offers them more money, they're going to go. I had a guy come in about four weeks ago. He said, sir, our tears in his eyes. I said, I hate to leave. You've been good to me. He says, but I'm going to be able to make $30,000 more than you paid me to go with Homeland Security. Our people are well trained. The, the feds would love to get some of our people, and I'm fighting like heck to keep them here. This is Alliance County. This is my home county. I care what goes on here. I care if a crime gets solved or not. Some agencies don't, and I hate to say that, but they don't. And so we'll go on, keep clipping if you want to. The career ladder, we did establish a career ladder right after I come in office years ago. But the thing is, that career ladder is good for Deputy 1 and Deputy 2. Nothing else. Because after that, if they stay good, 18 months good as a Deputy 1, they get 4.5% raise, go to Deputy 2. From Deputy 2, if they have good enough write up for uh, 36 months, they go to a Deputy 3. After that, the only way they can get promoted and get a raise is if a corporal position opens. And, you know, most of the time corporal positions don't open. When they get on up around sergeant and money gets better with other ages, they leave. And when they first come on, they may leave. On the last page, we put this together, and I'm hoping you folks, and I know it's not budget time, but please, Please take a look at this. If you will look at the money we are paying to retrain officers, and if you will look at the experience that we're losing, uh, we have made a salary increase proposal showing 5%, 8%, 10%, and 12%. I can tell you, if good Lord will allow us to get an 8% rate, it would put us pretty equal with everybody else. And I've talked to Brian. He uh, is wanting every year to be able to do a mer the merit like he has been. Is that not correct? I told him, if we could get that 8%, I would, uh, after that, go for a, a cent and a half for my paper on the merit. And that would keep us pretty much in competition with some of the local agencies around here. Folks, I don't know uh, how y'all feel, and I know y'all appreciate uh, what all the county employees do. 
But let me tell you something. I got some officers that qualify for food stamps. And you look right here, these people come tonight. They work every day busting their chops, putting their life on the line for the people here in the county. And I have never called on them to come out that they didn't come, regardless if it's Christmas Eve, Easter, or whatever. They believe in what we're trying to do here in Alamance County. And folks, I've got to keep these people. I'm asking you to look deep in your heart and your pocketbook, Brian, and, and see what you can do for my people. These are career officers that want to be here for career in Alamance County, but they also have to feed their family. You know, I've been up here for a long time, or too long, but I've never seen a more passionate, concerned, academic presentation in my life than what you've done here in life. And I mean that. Mm -hmm. And I would say to you that we're, we're in the middle of a state, of, we're two of the busiest interstates on the East Coast. Amen. And if you take a social economic picture of this county, I would say that that alone would show a demand for 10% more involvement of, of versus an average department. And you, you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir, I do. And uh, it's amazing. And, and I'm going to tell you something, Tim. I live with it every day watching my people bust their chops. And I'm telling y'all, I know your hands are tied in a lot of ways. But I would ask you, she's been in what some of our operations uh, Steve's watched some of our operations and I'm telling our people bust their chops and they do it for you and me and the people of this county That's right. and and I'm not and listen I know other departments in this county needs raises too but I'm telling you we're going to lose a bunch of our people and the more you lose the less uh, uh, efforts you you have the more problems you're going to have with employees and more problems we're going to have for this county. And these individuals there, you look at them, they work every single day to make sure this county is kept safe and we do it the right way. I have never had a, a citizen call this office, even if they live in the city, say, I can't get nobody to do nothing in the city. I call my people in. I say, look, they pay county taxes. Go take care of the problem. And they go take care of the problem. And the city people do pay county taxes. And I feel responsible to those individuals too. Because they vote for y'all and they vote for me. And they expect us to do our job. And uh, at this point, I guess that's all I got to say. You uh, did I a ask, good job, Sheriff. And I ask and beg y'all to please look at doing something yeah. for my people. And I promise you this you'll never be disappointed. Thank you. Let's have a 10 minute recess, please. All right, next item on our agenda is a presentation by Mr. Haygood about the Alamance County Detention Officer Social Security Bridge allowance, which I know he has spent, he and the sheriff have spent many, many, many hours working on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Good evening. Uh, you know, I will say, I uh, appreciate the passion that the sheriff shows. Uh, in support of his folks, no question about that. I've been with the county 22 years, and I'll be first to tell you that uh, at this time, I think the Alamance County Sheriff's Department is the best group of men and women that I've ever seen over there. Best trained, best outfitted, and they do a great job. And uh, you know, I will say that we've been watching turnover county government for the past uh, at least two years, really tracking it closely, and. Deputy one, detention one are uh, two of the highest turnover positions. We know that. Appreciate the sheriff uh, and his staff the work that they've done to put together these salary numbers. And we're working on the budget. We'll be coming to you April 6th with the retreat information, try to give you an overall look where we're at. But we recognize this. We recognize that there's a lot of turnover in our emergency service field. Uh, the other high turnover positions, telecommunicator, paramedic. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, some other ones that are pretty high turnover, too. But... Uh, just uh, appreciate the, the work the sheriff did to put that together for all the detention officers. I don't know if there's, uh, there's some detention officers here. I'm going to talk about this detention officer, Social Security Bridge Allowance, and I just want to say that uh, the sheriff has really been a spearhead on this and has not let it go. 
and uh, has worked with me and uh, legal and uh, human resources to put this uh, option for the commissioners considered uh, together, and we appreciate that. So, no further ado, we'll talk a little bit about uh, this new potential benefit for our detention officers. <clears throat> if you remember, commissioners, back on March 18th of 2019, the commissioners approved a resolution supporting a local bill. We sent a local bill down to Raleigh asking for permission to create a detention officer separation allowance. Uh, the sheriff's office was viewing that benefit as a recruiting and retention tool. The idea would be we'd be one of, if not the only, uh, detention center state that offers this uh, benefit similar to the separation allowance that patrol sworn officers get. But uh, the county's not able to offer that benefit. We had to ask the state to allow us to do that in the way that we had put it together. So the commissioners voted to send a request to Raleigh to give the county permission uh, to offer the separation allowance for detention officers. And as you know, that bill is still in committee. It's been in committee ever since. Kind of uh, has languished in Raleigh uh, since that time. So. Sheriff has uh, been like a bulldog on that thing and has uh, continued to tell us how important he believes this is to recruit and retain quality detention officers. So we've come up with an option for the commissioners to consider that can be done at the local level and it's very similar to the original separation allowance that we sent to uh, the General Assembly. And we've titled this new benefit for detention officers, Alamance County Detention Officer Social Security Bridge Allowance. So this would be a new benefit for eligible detention officers. And again, it's very sep uh, similar to the separation allowance that we had put together before. Uh, the board would have to vote to implement this new benefit, so it would take a vote by the Board of Commissioners. One of the main differences between this new benefit, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the particulars of it, and the law the, the, that we sent to Raleigh, is that if the Board of Commissioners approves this benefit, the authority to approve or rescind rides uh, with the Board of Commissioners. So the commissioners could at a later date uh, vote to uh, remove this benefit. But once a detention officer retires under this benefit, we would sign a contract with that detention officer. Once they retire, they receive the Social Security Bridge Allowance until they're eligible for Social Security, even if the commissioners were to vote to not offer the benefit to anyone else. So at time of retirement, the officer would come to us, we'd sign a contract, they would retire, they would be paid regardless of any action by the board. So uh, for this uh, Social Security Bridge Allowance for detention officers, the eligibility requirements are the same as uh, were the ones that were in the separation allowance. The detention officer would uh, have to demonstrate that they had served 15 consecutive years at the Alamance County Detention Facility, and they must be eligible for, uh, eligible for full local government retirement system retirement which means they uh, would need to have 30 years of service at any age or 25 years of service at age 60. And what this bridge allowance would do would be they'd start drawing their retirement. This allowance would kick in and supplement their retirement income until they were eligible to uh, receive Social Security. So currently at the detention uh, center, uh, there are 112, uh, there are 64 of the total 112 detention officers are eligible for this program. Some folks would not be eligible simply because of their age. They might be uh, going to retire at a point where they wouldn't be eligible, but 64 detention officers on staff right now would be eligible. That doesn't mean they receive it immediately. It just means they could hit the 15 years of service uh, with us. And 40 of those uh, 64 that are eligible have less than five years of service. So this kind of goes along with what the sheriff was talking about. They have uh, lots of turnover in detention, a lot of new folks working in detention. So we've got people there that if they work 15 years with us and hit these uh, eligibility for retirement uh, service amounts, they would, they would be able to receive this benefit. So the cost, there is a cost for the benefit. We have estimated that it would cost approximately $21,000 uh, per eligible detention officer that once they retire, right? So we've looked at all the detention officers that are eligible that are on the uh, county's payroll right now. We've estimated that it's $21,000 per detention officer. Uh, we, we do the same thing for the sworn side of the house, right? So the sworn officers are eligible for a separation allowance. That's part a law, not a local benefit. And there's a dollar amount that we pay every year for them too. So we've looked at the sheriff's uh, staffing levels. And when we think folks would be eligible to retire, to try to project what that cost might be if folks, if eligible detention officers started retiring. 
Fiscal year 1920, that's the year we are in right now. Uh, we have one detention officer that would be eligible to retire and meet all the requirements. If the commissioners voted tonight to institute this uh, uh, new benefit and the detention officer retired, it would cost $21,000 uh, to, uh, to start the benefit for the detention officer. Then we've looked out in future years. So for next year's budget, 2021, we would have to budget $42,000 because there are two detention officers that could retire that uh, might be eligible, that would be eligible for this benefit. And then in fiscal year 21-22, we would budget $63,000 to cover the cost of this benefit for those three uh, eligible detention officers that would retire. And then all the way from fiscal year 21-22, the fiscal year 31-32, the cost of the program, we are estimating it to be $63,000 annually. After the 31-32 fiscal year, that's a long way out. I mean, that, that, it does start going up, but that's a long time. I, we feel like looking out to 31-32 is probably about as far as we want to look. So we, if you vote uh, to, to institute this, we believe that it would get up to $63,000 a year that we would need to budget. Uh, but for next fiscal year budget, it would be $42,000. And just some general information about the Social Security bridge allowance. Uh, it is capped for Social Security amount. This is different than the law. The, the resolution that we sent to Raleigh for the separation allowance is different. We are required to cap the amount that a detention officer could receive to be no more than what they would receive if they, when they get their Social Security. So, a little different than the law. There is no tax impact for the detention officer. It's not considered deferred compensation, so they're not going to have to pay taxes on it until they are eligible for it. Uh, and the detention officer can work all the way through the Social Security age if they want to. They don't have to retire and take this, but it's an option that I'm sure they would consider. And we would include this, uh, the language, and, and you had in your packet the actual policy language for this, for this new benefit. We would include that language in our policy manual. And uh, the Sheriff's Department and the Detention uh, Center would be able to use this new benefit for recruiting purposes. So they would be able to tell employees uh, at the time they're talking to them, trying to get them to come to work for the detention office, uh, that they, they, this benefit does exist and they would be eligible for it. So a summary, uh, this Detention Officer Social Security Bridge Allowance is very similar to the separation allowance that we have sent down uh, to Raleigh. Uh, it would take board approval and only continue as long as the Board of Commissioners were uh, supportive of it continuing. There is a Social Security cap. That is a difference between the separation allowance, but it is not uh, a major difference. If the board votes to institute this, we would budget $42,000 next fiscal year to cover our projected costs, and the costs are pretty stable through uh, 31-32. And again, it does require a Board of Commissioner vote to initiate. So. Uh, as you know, detention officer is a very difficult job. I don't know that personally. I just know going over to visit and look at mainly at maintenance uh, concerns in the detention center, that's a tough job. We have a difficult time recruiting folks to do that work and a very difficult time to uh, keeping them on board. So this is a, uh, a reasonable benefit to consider, something that I think the sheriff's office hopes will help them recruit <coughs> High quality people, hopefully recruit people that are already working in detention elsewhere that would realize that this was a benefit that Alamance County is offering and then they would uh, they would come here. So we're we're interested in flipping the script as the sheriff just talked about how our folks have been recruited by others. We hope this might help us uh, uh, offer a benefit that other folks don't have. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I'm sure the sheriff uh, would be happy to answer anything about the, what this might mean for detention too. So. I'll make a motion that we approve it. Yeah. Let me ask you a quick question. Yeah, I support it too. What the philosophy of this carrying over to other departments? Though, I mean, is that is that possible? Is that legal? Or what's the issue there? Uh, it is. It is. My understanding is it's possible and legal. Uh, we're looking at it as a recruiting and retention tool, specifically for detention. Um, so it is something that could be considered. Although I think uh, one of the main issues here and one of the main benefits I think for detention is that the sworn officers in patrol have the same benefit through the law and, and detention officers do not and detention uh, work is uh, in my humble opinion very difficult too and uh, so it, it one it brings a little parity uh, and two I think it will it will put 
uh, the Alamance County Detention uh, Center ahead of the pack for a lot of other detention uh, centers when they're trying to bring people in. I'll second your motion. Any more questions or discussion? All right, we have a motion by Mr. Carter and a second by Mr. Lashley. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Ooh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on deck is uh, our tax administrator, Mr. Atkins. <clears throat> While we're waiting on him, Sheriff, what's that latest initiative? That's, I meant to show y'all, and, and we, we do a whole lot, but if you run that back, that's 340 50 some pound of garbage that our inmates picked up on Mineral Springs Road. One day. One road. Pressure on Bruce over there. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. I want y'all to see. Uh, we've got a whole lot of things going on. That's good. Right? And that, that truck load is picked up off of one. <coughs> Road. Is that the one we got from DOT? Yeah, those are that's the truck we got from BLET. Those are our inmates. They loved it. Believe me, they loved it. The problem is having people out there to, to make sure they don't run. And they're not going to run, but we have to have people out right. there. And that was just one day. Well, that's good. I happened to see it when <laughs> I looked up in there. But I'll tell you what it caused. It caused people in the other part of the county was riding by seeing it called, hey, I need it picked up on my road, sure. And I'm going to start transferring them to Brian. <laughs> we collect a little, mate. They're, they're calling me now. I'm transferring them to you, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how I'm getting on yes, 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 sir. He's adding to your call, buddy. I need something. I do want to clarify one point, Commissioners, about the detention officer supplement. Uh, I, we were thinking to make that effective immediately, so if that's, I just want to make sure that's clear and acceptable to the board. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk about accelerating our revaluation cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so this should be a presentation. I would be lost without my notes. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? <laughs> I have a, a former pastor that says, uh, blessed is he that preaches with notes because he knows when he is finished. <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, thank you for having me here this evening to talk about the revaluation cycle. And kind of what would it look like if we accelerated a cycle? What are the costs? What are the benefits? And I'd like to start with just a quick review. So in North Carolina, the, the minimum frequency is every eight years, and that's what Alamance County has been doing to perform a revaluation. The counties have the option to accelerate it to any cycle less than that that they so desire. Now, if you look at the statistics statewide, 54 counties are on the eight-year cycle, and 34 counties are on the four-year cycle. So definitely the predominant cycle statewide is still the eight-year. But the four-year is not an uncommon cycle, considering one and three are on that one. And there are a few other cycles out there. Um, obviously, we can put it wherever we want to. Now, for what may be a better comparison, I looked at the Department of Revenue, the way that they break down the counties by population. And we are in the highest population bracket of 100,000 plus. There's 27 counties in that bracket. And if we look at that bracket, it reverses itself. Eight counties are on the eight-year cycle. Fifteen are on the four. So now, if we if we group with peers based on population, it's two to one a four-year cycle. And that kind of begs the question: Why is it that the higher population counties prefer the shorter cycle, whereas statewide it's the longer cycle that's preferred? And a lot of it has to do with growth. The higher population counties are growing faster, and it's advantageous the faster you grow to go to a shorter cycle. Um, additionally, if you're a, a lower population county, resources can be an issue. At our scale, it, it's not that bad. I also looked at some of our neighbors, and I'd find neighbors, if they could live in Alamance County and commute to work, so 8540, I'm thinking Raleigh-Durham on the one side, Winston-Salem on the other side, and then just north and south a little bit. Uh, along with us on the eight-year cycle is Rockingham, Person, and Davison. Guilford and Randolph have already accelerated to a five-year cycle. Orange, Chatham, Caswell, Forsyth, and Wake accelerated to a four-year cycle. 
and Durham is on a three-year cycle, which is the shortest cycle in the state. So among our kind of neighboring group, again, is predominantly accelerated cycles, with the most common being four years. And one last <coughs> illustration. This is a counting map, and if it's not shaded, it's still on an eight. The shading uh, indicates any level of acceleration, again, predominantly the four in orange. And you can see that we're nestled right in within our region. It is very common to have some form of accelerated cycle. Now, <clears throat> we're talking about a reevaluation. We should think about, you know, what does this entail? What are we talking about doing? And the traditional approach is that you spend the two to four years before the reevaluation date trying to clean up your data. It's a garbage in, garbage out, good data in, good data out situation. And use uh, teams of individuals to go out and visit all the properties, other teams of individuals to code those into your computer system. And once you've got your data clean, you go into phase two, which is the value review phase. So at this point, you're setting up your schedule of values, that's your rate tables. You're setting land rates, you're doing neighborhood level evaluation, and then individual property level evaluation. And traditionally, those two go together as a package, and that's what we would call a revaluation. Alamance County has already left that model in favor of the split approach. So we see the two phases as two separate things that we're trying to do. So with data maintenance, instead of going out and looking at the whole county once in eight years, we look at one-eighth of the county every year. Now this is just data cleanup. We're not talking about changing values. We're just making sure that we have up-to-date, accurate, clean data. And this frees us up so that when we're talking about the revaluation cycle, we're really just talking about the value review component. The other part is already locked down and in process. We're debating when do you do value review on an eight, on a four, or something else. Now cost-wise, to maintain that data, we had to get two appraisers. Uh, which are in place now. Salary and fringe on those are about 115000 Two vehicles, and I just annualized the cost of the vehicles and included fuel and repair, that's $8,000. Supplies and equipment is 6500 license fees 4500 training 1000 Oblique photography, 45000 so that's where the plane flies over and it takes front, back, left, and right pictures and then they're kind of knit together into a 3D model. Uh, that's an important component of this data maintenance program. So all told, that's 180000 per year, and that piece is taken care of. It's just running year after year. If we wanted to actually change those values as part of revaluation, that is the value review uh, piece of it. So per project, so this is a two-year period of work. You're looking at $200,000 or 100000 a year contract for a reval coordinator. And that's about $50 an hour, which is the standard rate to get the, that skill level of person to come in and do the kind of work that we would need done. Uh, <clears throat> additionally, there's about 55,000 print and postage. We've got to get notices out, uh, 3,000 in subscriptions, and 6,000 in consulting. So over the course of a two-year project, it would be about 264,000 or about 132 per year. Now, this is not 132 every year. It's just two years. So if you're on an eight-year cycle, six years, you don't spend it. Two years, you do. If you're on a four-year cycle, you're two on, two off. So if we put that together right now for an eight-year cycle, the data maintenance piece is $1.4 million. The value review piece is $264,000 for a total cost of $1.7 million. Now, to put that in, in context, our 2009 reval was 1.6 million. Initial budget for the 2017 was 1.8, which was a very realistic number. We found ways to have quite a bit of savings on that, but that's atypical. Um, and kind of as a reality check, I looked at other counties of similar parcel counts and pulled their cost per parcel to reval, and I averaged that back and applied it to Alamance County, and it would call for about 1.7 as well. So I think 1.7 is, is a good baseline for us. If we wanted to go to a four-year cycle, well, initially, that's half as many years of data maintenance, so that's half as much. Same value review cost, it's just under a million dollars to do that revaluation, but you have to do twice as many of them. 
So at the end of the day, you end up spending just as much on data maintenance, but you're doing the value reviews twice. So it's an extra 264000 That's the difference. To go from an 8 to a 4 is an extra 264000 bringing it up to just under $2 million over an eight-year span. Now, <clears throat> let's think about the tax base and revenues. So this is a clip from the Herald Sun from February 23rd. It says in its first revaluation since 2016, homes in Wake County increased 20% in value from four years ago. Commercial properties increased 33%. So 20% in four years, that's 5% per year. And in fact, that tracks exactly with what we're seeing. Uh, we have to provide a sales ratio report to the state every year. And right now we're three years in and 15%. So that 5% a year is, is definitely what we're seeing. is the same as what they're seeing. Now, if we look at the median home sale price using January 2017 as a base, because that's when we put our revaluation in place. Uh, in North Carolina, if we go from 17 to 18, we're up 6%. 18 to 19, we're up 13%. 19 to 20, we're up 21%. That is a strong rate of growth. If we narrow that down to Alamance County, from 17 to 18, we're still up 6%. 18 to 19, 11.5%. 19 to 20, still 11.5%. And, and, and this is where, if I have numbers, I show it warts and all. Uh, I think that's an anomaly in the data. I don't understand why <coughs> there's no change, because our internals are showing that change. We're showing that 15%. It's not consistent with any of the other data, because if I run Burlington, Grand, and Mevin as a metro area, we go from 100 then we're up 6%, up almost 16%, then up 18%. So, so I don't understand why that specific number flatlines, and, and so I'm going to kind of ignore it. Um, because our in-house data is showing 15%, I think the reality is somewhere between the Burlington Grand Meta number, which is going to be higher, because it's going to be pulled down by the rural property a little bit, and at 11.5. So I think realistically, up 15% at this point, if we project forward exactly the way it's growing right now, then by 2022, the state's at 38%, county's at 20, the metro area's at 31%, and again, I think the county number there is flawed, so probably about 25%. Uh, That's 5% per year is what it has been growing. That's if we carry it forward. Uh, now, this is residential, so if I look over at commercial, this is the uh, average improved commercial market sale price. Again, using 17 as a base, it's up 5.5, then up 11.2, then up 14.6. Very similar growth pattern. If we project that out, we get to 25.5 increase. So that 25% number just keeps coming up if we're projecting based on this past performance. Now, right now, we have about $11.5 billion in taxable real. We've been growing at 2.38% per year for real property, so by 2022, we should be at about $12 billion. If we pick that up 25%, that brings us to $15 billion, or an increase of $3 billion to our tax base. For a revenue neutral number, what that would do, we've got categories, real, personal, public service company, and registered motor vehicle, I just carried our current numbers forward based on the average increase year to year to get to a 2021 estimate of $15.8 billion that the current tax rate would net us $106 million. If I carry them forward one more year but trade out the real property number for the $15 billion that we just found, that brings us to $19.4 billion. Now at that rate, to get $106 million, you'd need 54.7 cent for the tax rate. But the state allows us our usual year-to-year -year growth based on new construction. That's been averaging 3.82%, so the revenue neutral rate would be 568 or we'll say $0.57, because this is all estimates. So basically, that's 10% less than the current rate. If you wanted to be revenue neutral, it would let you drop it from 67 to 57 And this is where we have to talk about the elephant in the room. So coronavirus, COVID-19. I'm watching the stock market implode. I'm watching businesses shut down and no idea of when they're going to get back going. 
you know, we, we already have challenges in our community. I, they're, they're beginning, they're not ending. Uh, what is that going to do to our economy? I know that we've been really strong for a really long time, and everybody's been calling for some kind of a correction or recessionary period, <coughs> and this could well be a trigger for that. So when I'm projecting 5% forward, that's because it's in the data. That's not because I'm ignorant. It's because it's trended that it's way. It's trended okay. that way. But I think we need to consider some other things. So if we go to a more traditional growth from this point forward at 2%, then we're up about 19% as of 2022. That's a value increase of $2.28 billion. And that brings us to 18.7 billion, or a revenue neutral rate of 59 cents. So that's not so bad, right? We're we're down eight cent off where we're at now. If we want to go revenue neutral, well, what if we go backwards? What if this five percent a year reverses for the next two years? So our 15 percent position becomes a five percent position. Well, at least we're still up, but only 600 million for a base of about $17 billion for a revenue neutral of $0.65. Cent. It's a $0.02 cent difference. And, and what I want to impress is how wide this swing is. And it depends on what happens in the next two years. And I have no crystal ball. <laughs> so I don't want you to, to think that the rosy picture is it's coming our way. I about bet it isn't. But exactly what we'll see, who knows. Uh, but that's what that would, would look like. So what does that mean for revenue? And, and, and this is what I've got to stress, is that revenue is determined by the tax rate. If a revenue neutral rate is adopted, there will be no additional revenue from the revaluation. There will be the year-to-year -year new construction growth, but that'll be it. If a rate above or below revenue neutral is adopted, then revenue will increase or decrease. So we're talking about equalizing property values. We're talking about getting back in sync with the market but it's the tax rate that drives revenue. There are some other considerations though that you need to be aware of. Um, the first is that the Department of Revenue sets a threshold at 85% of the market, and I've mentioned that we're sitting at 85% of the market. If you go below that point, they have a mandatory revaluation in three years, and we are by the skin of our teeth above it. Um, the recession might pull us in the other direction. Barring that, will go below it next year and it will trigger a mandatory in 2024. So I don't know what to predict because I don't know what's about to happen. Barring recession, we can't hit eight years, it'll be seven years because it'll force us to. <coughs> that doesn't mean they reset your cycle to a seven year cycle. You're still in an eight year cycle, they just pull it one year forward. But it might be a good time to think about making a change. The more important thing that, that I want you to notice. Um, in the reval year, in the fourth year after reval, and in the seventh year after reval, the Department of Revenue uses that report we're sending them, and they ask us a simple question. They say, are you below 90%? And if we answer why yes, we are, they adjust our public service companies down so that they're on par with our other assessments. Now, the good news is we get to weight in our personal property, which is always at 100%. So that, that mitigates it a little bit. But we begin to lose revenue off of public service companies. In my example, I'm going to ignore railroads because they're a little more complicated, they're a little more severe. And this is going to be a simplified example just to show you the principle. So if we take a, a modest 2% per year value growth, this is what it looks like. At Reval, we're at 100%. The year after, we're at 98 Because the market's up 2%, so relative to the market, we're down 2%. <coughs> That continues 96, 94, down to 86. In 2021, the DOR knocks on the door. Are you below 90%? No, we're not. Carry on. In 2024, are you below 90%? Yes, we're at 86. They say, great, well, you can keep 88.39% because they're going to weight it with their personal property of your public service companies which means you're going to lose $348,000 off of public service companies. That's revenue dollars. That alone pays for the difference between an eight-year cycle and a four-year cycle. That's a 2% growth. Now, if we hit that 5% growth, you get something very different. So in this scenario, in 2021, when they knock at that door, we're at 80%. First of all, they trigger a reval, so we never get to year eight. Secondly, we can keep 82.8%. 
which in this scenario, you lose 448,000. The next year, you lose 470. The next year, you lose 492. You lose $1.4 million that could have been avoided by spending 264 to be on a four year cycle and just derailing this whole thing. Now, with the very possible recession, what if we go backwards? If we go backwards to 90%, we're safe. If we miss it by even 1%, if we hit 89% instead, we still trigger it. So next year, if we're at 89% instead of 90, if it doesn't recede that far, we start losing. 246, 258, 270, we lose 776,000. Again, this can be avoided with a four-year cycle that costs 264,000. And so I think it's not a revenue issue to reevaluate at a higher frequency as far as going out and finding more revenue. It's preventing this loss because they will equalize public service companies and that will take revenue away unless we've done something to prevent it. So that's, that's my concern. Now, if the Board of Commissioners is interested to change the revaluation cycle, it's really just as simple as adopting a resolution stating when the next reval is to be and what the new cycle will be thereafter, and a copy of that gets sent to the Department of Revenue, and it's done. It's very easy to change the cycle. Right now, we're very capable of doing it for 2022, but the window is closing rapidly because we would need to be in production as of July 1. Um, we can do 2023 as well. It gives us a little bit more road. That's a six year and for four year. Uh, and obviously we can do any cycle that, that the board so desires. Uh, but the soonest I think that we can do it would be 2022. Um, do you have any questions or anything I might be able to help with? It's amazing what a couple of weeks does, huh? In your thought process oh, there. Boy. <laughs> Mm. Oh, yeah. When I started researching, I was a lot more sunny than I am this morning and yeah. this evening. So. Well, where does that lost revenue go? I mean, what? It's gone. It's evaporated. So it, it just isn't, it isn't billed. It goes to those companies. The, the logic behind it is this. So I'm the assessor for the real and the personal and the registered motor vehicles, but I'm not the assessor for public service companies. That's retained to the state themselves. So they do those assessments. These are gas pipelines, energy companies, cable companies, railroads, this sort of situation. Because they want to be consistent across county lines. So you have one assessor statewide. But these companies own real property. Well, if they're in a county that the real property has gotten out of whack, but they're getting assessed for full by the state, they're really kind of suffering. They want to be treated like everyone else. And if you're out of whack with the rest of them, put us down too. That's what takes place, and it's just a savings to the company. It doesn't go to the state, it doesn't go to us. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, my understanding is that if uh, the board decides to do this, we would vote at the time that the budget is adopted, right? Yes, we would include, I think, the cost for 2021 we would budget $132,000 uh, additional funding in the, if we're going to if we were going to do this uh, for 2021 we would budget 132,000 and then if that stays in the budget if that's a, a, a way that commissioners want to go uh, upon adoption of the budget we would also bring a resolution to the board that Jeremy would need to go to the Department of Revenue I trust you more than anything as far as <laughs> What you know and how you can research. I think we know what's the kind of, as far as the downturn. Uh, so it looks I'd like be shocked. If it, if it, mm -hmm. That's exactly what it looks like. Yeah. What would you do? Mm -hmm. As far as what do you recommend? You know our with, objectives. With the downturn coming? Yeah. I don't know how strong it is. So if it's strong enough to pull us to ninety percent, you wait. Because this whole scenario evaporates. And you're on a fall. Yeah, and you're on a fall. Now, you run this risk. Here's the problem. I don't know how long. Um, we could end up in a position where by 2025, when we're forced to do it on the eight year, that we're actually under where we're at now if it falls far enough, long enough. So you may run the risk. You might be better to cut your losses and do it now. And then you could always push back to an eight later if we were in a gully. Uh, but barring that, Maybe you don't do it because you don't lose out on that money on public service companies. 
But if we fall but 1% shy, they don't check it every year. They check it one time and lock it until year seven, and we just start to bleed, and, and that's the problem. Now, I'm not optimistic that we've got those, those positive numbers, which when I first started looking at it, I thought, this looks great. <laughs> and then I'm watching the news every day, and it's just not working for me. Market, right? No. <laughs> um, but that's the question is I don't know how far, how fast. If I knew for sure it would clear 90, maybe wait. But you just have to be ready that you might at the next revalve go down. Um, you do it now, you cut your losses a little bit. When we look at it from the perspective of our taxpayers, mm -hmm. we go from, four, from eight to four. Mm -hmm. We're shortening the cycle, mm -hmm. or accelerating the cycle. Mm -hmm. So if property values have increased, then they're going to get a bigger tax. Are they going to get a bigger valuation? We look at it revenue neutral, it could pull the tax rate back down, but essentially they pay in the same dollar. Mm -hmm. Then if they, but the other side of that issue is if you wait eight years and you get a valuation, then their numbers can get bigger than they would over the four-year four cycle. Well, certainly, the, the revenue neutral is a big component because that prevents really wild swings. It, even if it goes up dramatically or goes down dramatically, a revenue neutral shift controls for that. What does happen is there's an allocation between real and personal slash motor vehicle. Okay. If the real is allowed to get way out of whack, if it gets very discounted, so to speak, because there's not been a revaluation, we've got lots of growth, then if I own real property, my taxes are discounted, and that's shifted on the person that has personal property. And we can't assume that people have real and personal in the same ratios. When you revalue, it shifts it back. Um, or reverse, if we were to suddenly have a drop off, because back in 2010 through 2013, we were 10% off in the other direction. In that case, the real property owner was kind of paying a premium versus the personal property owner. So a lot of what a revaluation does is it re the load to try to keep the load as even as possible. And it controls, if you've got an area of rapid growth and an area in decline, that more frequent cycle lets you keep pace so that you're not paying unrealistic amounts. change over the next few weeks and we'll get a well, better picture. And, and there is this option, though I hate to suggest it, which is if you were to plan for an earlier date, you can always take <coughs> it back. You don't have to keep it. So if we plan for 2022 and everything was coming off the rails, we could push it back to 2024, 2025. Um, if you don't do that, you're up against a hard deadline. Now you're out whatever money you spent. You got couple hundred thousand dollars, but then again, by that day, that might look like a deal. I, I don't know. I just, this is where if I had a crystal ball, I would, I would make a lot of money if I had a crystal ball, but I don't know. That's right. I, I, I think fairness for the taxpayers in four years. Yeah. It keeps you more up to date with what right. your values are and mm -hmm. keeps us up to date with what the county is saying. Well, and I think in the long-term sense, the highs and the lows, even in that modest growth example, you make the money back on public service companies. Right. I, I think it's worth it. Good information. Yep. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. Good, good job. Thank you so much. All right, the next item on the agenda is my presentation. It's a resolution in support of the state of North Carolina's proposed fiscal year 2019 2021 biennium budget. Um, I had some conversation with our state senator, Rick Gunn, um, about the importance of the budget, particularly as it applies to Alamance County. Um, there is a total of $29.5 million sitting in Raleigh waiting for uh, permission to be allocated to Alamance County. It includes $18 million in capital funding for the public school system, uh, $7.9 million in capital funding for the community college. Uh, relevant to the coronavirus is $15,000 to the Fawcett 
volunteer fire department and fifteen thousand dollars to the snow camp volunteer fire department we're relying on volunteer fire departments to help us um, sustain that network of emergency services that are threatened by the virus there's a there's a lot of other things listed in the in the presentation and in the resolution the resolution calls on the governor Cooper and the members of the General Assembly to uh, or act in accordance with the needs of the state and support Alamance County by taking measures to ensure these important programs included in the proposed state budget are funded for the institutions and communities that they will so clearly benefit. Um, I've had other conversations with um, different parts of different uh, state agencies affected by the budget like I think Department of Social Services in Alamance County. Um, I had a really good conversation with the Agriculture Commissioner Steve Troxler a couple months ago. Now he was telling me about the um, real severe problems for his um, for the Department of Agriculture with things being held up in the state budget and with the coronavirus and the new challenges. It's time for North Carolina to have a budget. For this year, um, it's time for Governor Cooper to sign a budget. It's time for the General Assembly to um, take whatever action they can take to get us a budget. So that's the the background and the purpose of the resolution. And I'm happy. To, on it. <laughs> I'm happy to answer whatever questions y'all have or comments. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the resolution. Um, if there's no more discussion, then everybody in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Good, good, proper. We need we need a state budget. Need it's somebody. it's really it's hurting the state. The fact that we do not have a state budget. Our, our operations, our missions, they're suffering. We can't do it. We got our own budget to worry about right. now. Yeah, we <laughs> we got to do another one by That's June fine. 30th around here. We so. not passing the budget yet, huh? no. no, we cannot. All right, next item on our agenda is a budget amendment for a plastic pesticide recycling program. And there he is, Mark Daniel. <laughs> Good evening. So I'm here tonight to ask for permission to apply for a grant from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture for their pesticide plastic container recycling program. So what this will do, we will pay for a 40 foot uh, shipping container that we'll put down the parking lot uh, where actors used to park their buses. And primarily this is for the ag community. So where producers can bring their triple wrenched uh, pesticide containers we have placed into our shipping container there uh, behind our office. And then once that container is full, then the NCDA will send the contractor by to collect those containers and then we can start over again. I'll make a motion that we do this. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve that budget amendment. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sheriff, you have a budget amendment? Thank you again. Uh, I'm up here to ask permission from the commissioners to be able to apply uh, for a COPS grant on human trafficking for three law enforcement officers to work the human trafficking cases in ICAP and this crime against children in Alamance County. It's a 70% funding by feds, 30% by local and the federal cost would be $375,000 and our cost over a three-year period would be $164,926.83. We've investigated our officers working with Homeland Security and federal agencies investigated over 48 human trafficking cases. This year, uh, February uh, 2019, August uh, 2019, September 2019, and January 2020, we've arrested over 71 people involved in the prostitution industry and human trafficking. And a lot of those that we were only able to make prostitution cases were human traffickers, but we just could not get the female victim talking against their pimp. 
and where will this fund, how, our contribution, where are we going to come up with 164? We'll have to budget that in the sheriff's uh, budget for uh, next fiscal year. Okay. <clears throat> we, we, I'll assure you, I'm trying to find the money to do a lot of things in our budget. And uh, like I said, if we don't, then fine. But we, we're, this is a way that we can get a, three officers that are badly needed to go after this particular crime. Along with human traffickers is also your uh, cartel that's uh, doing a lot of it. The first year sheriff commissioners from the county we would we would be budgeting for the sheriff's office would be forty one thousand two hundred thirty one dollars. So that it would not be the full one hundred right. sixty four thousand. Three years all of it in one it's year. Two, three years. Spread out over three years. Well, I would make a motion that we allow you to do so. Thank okay. you, sir. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve that budget amendment and allocate those funds. Uh, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, Sheriff. We had no public speakers sign up for non agenda items. Uh, Mr. Haygood, do you have a county manager report? I do not. Do we have any commissioner comments tonight? we've done a lot of work <laughs> yes we have that's why we do it right that's why we have meetings because we have a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. We've got some, i mean we demonstrated here tonight too that we have some really hard work with county employees and they've done a beautiful job at protecting our citizens so. that, i mean we just can't say enough about them no. i mean we had stacy saunders here she did she's doing an incredible job Jeremy Akins, our tax administrator, did an amazing presentation. I know the sheriff doesn't work for us, he works for the people because he's an elected official. We could see his um, pride in his department coming through and how passionate he is. Um, and all y'all been here this evening. Um, you folks from the sheriff's department came out on Monday night, staying late, could have been doing other things. You're here, that shows your passion and commitment too. We just really appreciate y'all. So, that being said, if there's nothing else, we'll be adjourned. We have a closed session. Today. Oh, we got a closed session. Dang it! <laughs> 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 we go if you need to. Hang on a minute. Closed session. All right. I move that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318.11A3 in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the county attorney and the board and consult with the county attorney regarding the claims made in the matter entitled Rivas versus Alamance County. So we have a motion and a second uh, to go into closed session. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay, if we could have a, a motion to reenter. We have a motion and a second to leave closed session and return to open session. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, Anyone opposed? All right, I have a statement to read. The board received legal advice from the county attorney concerning the resolution of the Rebus claim and authorized the resolution of the claim. So all other business before the board being concluded will be adjourned. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. 
You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.